part of um, what we're looking at in today's talk is the idea that shopping has evolved and we're our expectations of the retail experience are changing in accordance to the way we do things online as well. So there's a few kind of quick stats to kind of get us thinking about our degree of patience for obstruction in shopping these days. Three quarters of us can't be bothered to hang around on a website long enough to fill out a registration form if that's what we're asked for. We just move elsewhere. We're prepared to wait an astounding average of two whole seconds for a web page to download. And if that delay extends to a massive three seconds, 40% of us will just cut and run at that point, abandon ship completely, quite possibly never to visit that online store again. Already we're impatient when we're just dealing with this stuff sort of online, at home, on the sofa, on our laptops or whatever, but increasingly the drift is towards taking technology with us when we go out. We're carrying smartphones and we're taking these experiences out into the real world. We have to get better and better and better and keep improving at this stuff all the time. And it really, really is an important thing because a lot of money is at stake with this kind of stuff. Um, looking at the example of PayPal, for example, we can see how our, our drift into online retail is gradually, gradually building. It wasn't really that much money being transacted through mobile phones, uh, 2007, 2008. But look at the leap between 2008 and 2009. It's kind of extraordinary. Does anybody care to hazard a guess what happened in that year? It wasn't the launch of the iPhone, but it's when the iPhone started getting traction and the App Store opened. And the minute the App Store opened, PayPal are in like Flynn with their own PayPal payment app and suddenly, lo and behold, it's easy to do this stuff on your phone. And so it opens up this whole new world of online commerce on the hoof wherever you are. And what it goes to show is that improving the consumer experience in these little, um, tiny little ways makes a huge, huge difference to the, to the extent that this year, PayPal expect to transact $7 billion through mobile payments alone. That's just PayPal. So imagine what everyone else is doing alongside that. So this stuff really, really matters. What's happened is that a lot of the emphasis so far has been on things like price. If you guys aren't familiar with the concept of showrooming, it's that thing where you might wander into a store to check out the goods in real life, get a sense of how they feel, how big they are, what size they are, but then you whip out your smartphone and do a price comparison by scanning the barcode there and then, and lo and behold, you discover that 50 yards down the street, somebody else is selling it cheaper, so off you go there to buy the damn thing. Now, you can imagine the kind of terror this strikes into the hearts of retailers, because Customers are being stolen away even while they're in the aisle of your shop. Oh my God, how horribly demoralizing that must be. What I want to look at today is the idea that shopping is more than processing a payment. It's much, much more than that. And there are things that technology can do to add value to that whole experience rather than just stripping away until there's nothing left but the exchange of money and goods. So I wanted to look at this quote from Breakfast at Tiffany's because for me it nails the idea of experience within the context of retail. You'll have seen the film, Holly Golightly frequently suffers from attacks of the mean reds, even worse than the blues, and she says, the only thing that does any good is to jump in a cab and go to Tiffany's. It calms me down right away, the quietness of the proud look of it. Nothing very bad could happen to you there. So it's this idea of an unbelievable emotional connection with a brand and a place and a location that's got so much more power and resonance to it than the idea of just, there's your goods, there's your money, over. First brand that I wanted to talk about is a fashion chain from Japan called Vanquish. They're based in the Shibuya district, very cool, um, forward-thinking brand. And they did this really lovely experiment with um, RFID tags, radio frequency identification tags, embedded in the hangers of all of the items of clothing in their store. Now what this meant was that whenever you went in there and picked up a specific item, the tag would send a signal to the, um, to the system embedded throughout the store, and the screen above that item would spring into life and pull in additional content that was relevant to that particular garment. So in the same way that when you're shopping on Net-a-Porter or something like that, 
If you're looking at a particular dress, you'll be shown accessories or shoes or a bag that goes with it. This particular technology was drawing in uh, a cloud of related items that could perhaps contribute something to that item or that potential outfit um, that you were looking at. And the other sweet thing about this as well is that it also has the potential to influence the music that plays in the store when you pick it up, so it might change the track to something that's a bit more suited to that style of clothing, or it could alter the lighting as well. So what you get is this more immersive experience in response to nothing more than picking something up. So there's no jumping through technological hoops. You do not have to input any data to make this happen. You just go in and do what you do normally. So a really nice, seamless way of bringing technology and additional um, inspiration into that environment. And we see a really interesting kind of evolution of that idea with um, the Singaporean telecoms brand Starhub. Um, not a retail brand in the traditional sense of it, but they created uh, an initiative that saw them linking up with lots of quite young directional fashion retailers around Singapore on a campaign that was designed with a very specific purpose in mind, and that purpose was to sell more tracks through their online music store. How did they do that? Again, with RFID tags. They got somebody, I don't, know, I don't know who this genius was, but they got somebody to match specific music tracks from different genres of music with specific items that were available on the shop floor. And it's tapping into this sense that young people like to dress like the bands that influence them. So it's a kind of tribal thing. They matched up all these songs with all these garments, added an RFID tag to those garments so that when you went into the changing room, automatically a track by that artist would begin playing as you were trying this on. When I heard about this particular campaign, I thought it felt pretty far-fetched, to be honest. And I just thought, you know, how is this ever going to work out, really? But the fact is, they got really kind of extraordinary results for this. They, um, they found that an average click-through rate of 84%. So when people were receiving these tracks, they were interested enough to follow through and listen to the rest of the tracks streaming via Starhub. They, they recommended 47,000 songs from 16 different music genres. But obviously the standout statistic from that little list is the fact that it familiarized and raised awareness of the Starhub store to such a degree that sales of tracks rose there by 21%. So we're seeing a really kind of tangible interplay between that experience and sales, the bottom line for Starhub in this case. That's an interesting experience and what it does is kind of a really interesting thing with that relationship between music and fashion. That's really kind of a, a close thing that I think is rather underexplored in a lot of kind of retail environments. And also it, it makes use of that moment where you go into the changing room in kind of a spirit of hope, a slightly altered state that something transformative is about to happen. And I think retailers would do really, really well to explore a little bit further what happens in that space. Changing rooms are unbelievably patchy, at least in the UK, when it comes to the experience they deliver. If you can't even offer like a basic cubicle that's well lit and tidy, um, why, why would you do that to your customers? The idea that you can enhance this experience, you should be doing everything you possibly can to make this a somewhat joyous occasion for your customers in any way possible, by any means necessary. So just if somebody can make something of that, I would be so delighted. The idea that technology can enhance feelings and emotions is a really, really powerful one. And I think we're just beginning to see people really begin to understand this and make it pay. I think this example from the ASICS training shoe brand um, is really interesting for the connection it makes on an emotional level with people. So um, the idea was uh, around the New York Marathon, they created uh, a technological infrastructure it's kind of really pretty straightforward in terms of what can be done these days, but they created a website so that if, if your partner or your friend was competing in the marathon, you could upload photographs or uh, an image showing you supporting them or some text, a text message saying, come on, Jack, we know you can do it, that kind of thing, a kind of rousing statement to help spur them on. And they set up video booths along the route for a week before the race so that you could record a face-to-face -face message to the camera as well. When the athletes turned up to register for the race, they didn't just get their, their bib and their number. They also got an RFID tag to tie onto their shoe. 
So when they ran across the special mats at strategic points throughout the 26-mile course, a signal was sent to a gigantic billboard that was in full view of the runner at that point, and they would receive their message of support at some critical moment in the race when they were probably absolutely on their arses, dying for a break, dying for a drink, and just gave them that extra support to continue with the run. It's really, really... Um, kind of touching way. I mean, nobody at that point is thinking, oh my God, RFID is awesome. They're thinking, oh Jesus, I totally forgot I had that stupid tag on my shoe, but I think I can keep going now because my wife is up there saying that she supports me. It's a completely emotional thing. I also want to talk about this idea that um, retail experiences should not have to be just something that happens to you and only you and that begins and ends with just one person. I think what's interesting about the potential for technology and retail at the moment is this idea that if you create experiences that are compelling enough for people, they're going to want to share those experience, experiences with their friends, maybe with their family, and spread the news a little bit. Because if something cool happens to you out on Oxford Street, your first impulse these days tends to be to reach for your phone, take a shot, upload it to Facebook, or send it to somebody. And so there's a huge opportunity there for brands to kind of capitalize on this. We're, we're living in the middle of what's being termed the image explosion, and not without good reason. This is a huge year for all things Diana Vreeland, and you know, the, the title of the film that's being published about her life, based on a quote from Diana Vreeland herself, the eye has to travel. This has been ringing in my ears for the last few weeks since I read an article entitled The Image Explosion because the interest and the fascination that we're seeing with um, imagery and photography and the rapid exchange of that is completely extraordinary right now. It's kind of unprecedented. So if you're a brand that wants to be involved with how people are living their lives and to forge some kind of emotional connection with them, being involved in that existing behavior and part of that photography image-led trend is a hugely beneficial thing. This statistic completely floored me when I read it. 10% of all the photos taken by humankind ever were taken in the last 12 months. Can you imagine that? We've been taking photographs since like the late 1800s. Can you imagine the proportion that that's going to rise to next year? It's extraordinary. And the idea that brands or retailers um, can afford to not be a part of this is ludicrous, clearly. So thinking in terms of how you can make what you do fit in and mesh with that behavior is likely to be an extraordinarily useful exercise for anybody working in this field. A particularly sweet example of the kind of relatively easy to begin level is this idea from Flair magazine, it's a Belgian title. It's a bit like Grazia, I guess. So a weekly magazine with a real fashion focus, but a kind of gossip angle as well. So they knew that their readers were kind of obsessively looking to their magazine for inspiration, but also, you know, women look at their friends for inspiration when it comes to what they might want to wear. And they realized that there was all this activity happening on Facebook, but it was kind of taking place without them. So they decided to do something that could harness some of that activity. It's not a kind of blockbusting thing, but it's a really kind of sweet little bit of kudos. If your picture gets up there on the Flare magazine site, and you get that additional kind of profile and perspective amongst your friends. And we see this kind of thing on sites like the Sartorialist, for example, where we'll see an amazing shot of a beautifully turned out woman. We'll think, where in God's name did she get that amazing coat? And somebody in the comment section might go, ah, it's a Marnie coat from three seasons ago. And you're like, ah, right, at least that's answered the question in my mind. But can anybody see the, the glaring missing item from that campaign idea from Flare magazine? They've got these pictures. We know where the clothes are from. Where do you buy it? The link to buy that item. My God, somebody get those up there. It's a huge opportunity waiting to be taken advantage of. And people are already working on this basis. I think the next example I find extraordinary because it's, it's so compelling. It's from a brand called Vankel. I think that's how you pronounce it, which is a Chinese brand. It's the number one Chinese clothing brand by volume, I think, the biggest retailer in, in China right now. They've been going for four years. 
And they started this extraordinary commission-driven sharing program. They created a social site that allows fans of the brand to upload pictures of themselves wearing Vankel outfits. Now, if you get enough love from other people visiting your profile, you become a Vankel star. So the most popular girls in the most popular outfits are accepted into this affiliate program that gives them a 10% kickback if anybody clicks on the items that are featured on that particular post and buys them from the Vankel Eat e-store. So Vankel handles the, um, the sale and the shipping side of things. And the girl who got the publicity and got the eyeballs on that outfit gets a reward for her good taste, her excellent photography, and her entrepreneurial instinct. It's a really kind of lovely thing. I was reading a, a little bit more about this last night as well, and I was completely floored to discover that in China, the, there's, a, there's a lot of very specific behavior around things like the delivery of goods that you buy online, because people are suspicious that goods will be tampered with in transit, issues like that. But Vankel couriers, we're talking about a relatively budget brand here, Vankel couriers wait while you try on the items that have been delivered to your house and immediately take back the items that don't fit or that do not match your expectations in some way. They stay there and they take them right back by return. How amazing is that? Is anyone here from ASOS? <laughs> Yay. Maybe one day, maybe one day. Um, wouldn't that be wonderful? So, you know, this is an incredibly connected, well thought through idea. And the idea that this stuff won't spread um, feels, feels wrong to me. Whatever you're doing, whether it's marketing or service design, there's a need to go beyond just branding and think about it being useful, being relevant to your consumers, or at least being entertaining in what you do. Otherwise, you just don't get noticed these days and people pass by your work and forget about it and move on. And the final thing, this is a quote that kind of leaps out at me. It's about 100 years old. G.K. Chesterton, we're perishing for want of wonder, not for want of wonders. This idea that we've got this insanely exciting world of opportunity and of technology, uh, and there's so much that we can do with it. But we're very jaded about the capability of this stuff to deliver. I think it's the, the job of people who work in these industries and technology the fashion industry is a gift of an industry. It's all about creativity and newness and development and iteration, the next and the new. Instilling a kind of a rekindling a sense of that wonder in people at what you can achieve with this stuff is a huge part of what people working in this industry should be thinking about. And yeah, I hope you do, and I hope you enjoyed the last 50 minutes or whatever. <laughs>